everyone. My name is Leslie Miles. I'm the Royal Society's Chief Strategy Officer, and I'm so pleased to welcome you all here to tonight's event. Um, thank you to all of you in the hall who've made it through the rain to get here, and to, and to those of you who are watching live um, online. Um, before we get going, can I remind you all to put your phones to silent, please? Um, and just a few um, housekeeping issues. We don't have a planned fire alarm tonight, so if, there, if you do hear an alarm, um, please could you make your way out through the um, exit signs as shown either side of the hall. On to tonight's discussion. This is the second event in our You and the Planet series. These events aim to inspire a positive vision of a future where human activity protects and enhances the health of the planet. We're bringing together experts from across science, business, and politics to discuss how this can be achieved and how the transition to a low carbon future can benefit as many people as possible. This series is touring around the UK and we're delighted to be holding our energy event here in Wales, a place with such a strong association with the energy industry and now a hub of science and innovation for renewable technology. We have an excellent panel joining us tonight's to discussion, and I'm really excited to hear what they've got to say. Thank you to all of you um, here and at home who've submitted questions in advance to the panel. Um, actually, we've had more than 300 questions, so we can't get through them all. We've tried to group them to cover as many topics as you have shown an interest in as possible. Your contributions and setting the questions have really helped to frame tonight's discussion. If you would like to tweet during the event, please use the hashtag you and the planet. Um, and that's all from me right now. Thank you again for joining us this evening. So please join me in welcoming to the stage our chair, Rachel Garside, and our speakers, Julia Brown, Juliet Davenport, James Durrant, and Rebecca Heaton. Thank you. Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Rachel Garside. I'm a journalist and broadcaster at BBC Wales, and I'm delighted to be hosting this event on behalf of the Royal Society. Now, Swansea's Brangwyn Hall is providing a very impressive backdrop for what I'm sure will be a very stimulating discussion, particularly given the standing and expertise of our panellists. So let me formally introduce them to you. First to my left is Baroness. Julia Brown. Julia is an engineer, crossbench peer in the House of Lords and a fellow of the Royal Society. She's the vice chair of the UK's Committee on Climate Change, chair of the Carbon Trust and was awarded a damehood in 2012 for her services to higher education and technology. Now next to Julia is Juliet Davenport. Juliet is founder and chief executive officer of Good Energy and has been an innovator in the areas of climate change and energy for over 20 years. She's Vice President of the Energy Institute and sits on the board of the Renewable Energy Association and Innovate UK. We then have Professor James Durrant, who is Sayre Cymru Solar Professor at the University of Swansea and Professor of Photochemistry at Imperial College London. He founded the UK's first, sorry, the UK's Solar Fuels Network and was the founding Deputy Director of Imperial's Energy Futures Laboratory. He is a Fellow of the Royal Society and the Learned Society of Wales. And finally, we have Dr. Rebecca Heaton. Rebecca is head of climate change at Drax, the UK's largest renewable energy generator, where she has responsibility for the group's efforts to mitigate climate change. She has a 20-year global career working at the interface between business, science and policy, and is a member of the UK's Committee on Climate Change, where her duties include representing Wales. So please join me in welcoming our panellists this evening. And I'd also like to mention, for those who are internet savvy, to join in the conversation on social media using the hashtag YouAndThePlanet. Now, to set the scene, I think it might be useful to have a few facts and figures uh, relating to our topic tonight of energy. Um, starting with the fact that Wales is 
a net exporter of energy. So in other words, we produce and export, export more energy than we use. Also in April this year, the Welsh Government and that declared a climate emergency. And the aim, they said, was to have a carbon neutral public sector in Wales by 2030. I think it's also worth mentioning that two sizable energy projects for Wales have been shelved in the last year or so. Now, these included plans to build two new nuclear reactors on Anglesey, so Wilva B. Uh, that was shelved earlier this year. And the world's first tidal power lagoon in Swansea Bay, which was a 1.3 billion renewable energy project, was turned down by the UK government last year. So given that context, let's uh, start by asking uh, Julia, what, um, we know we're facing big environmental challenges. Why is it important to talk about energy in that context? Well, well, if we think of energy not just about electricity, but if we think of the energy, uh, the electricity we use, uh, the energy we use to power our cars, the energy we burn in many of our homes as heating, uh, the energy used in industry perhaps as, uh, as, uh, as process heat. Uh, if we look at all of those types of energy, they contribute 80% of the UK's greenhouse gas emissions. So unless we address decarbonising energy, we, we aren't going to meet our, our net zero targets. Julia, does that mean that we're at some sort of crossroads, really, in terms of deciding how we move forward? We might want cleaner energy, but we don't quite want to give up the fossil fuels either, do we? No, and I think, um, I mean, I think this debate has been going on for quite a while. So obviously the evidence on climate change has been around for about 20 years at least. Um, and we've been trying to think about how we transition. But I think you've always got a difficulty in imagining a future because there are so many organisations who are linked to the present. And so therefore trying to move from the structure and the infrastructure that we've already built in a high carbon world to a low carbon world can feel very uncomfortable. Um, and we are at that point now where I think Climate Change Committee basically said we mustn't build any more gas grid. So we, we, we continue to build the infrastructure that is based around a high carbon world and we need to stop that now and move to a low carbon world. So I think we are at a tipping point, mainly because there's so much more public interest than we've ever seen before. James, does it, is it useful to have a government declaring a climate emergency? Is that, is that meaningful and do those targets matter? Clearly, it helps focus our minds and the government's minds on the urgency of a challenge. I, I, I'm quite struck that on one level, of course, renewables, we, we have so far to go in order to have, have renewables be a dominant power source. But I, I remember 15 years ago when my son was going to his primary school, and we were so excited because there was a solar-powered parking meter outside, of, outside the school. And I took a photo and I showed it everywhere. This is amazing. The UK has got solar. <laughs> um, now I notice the photos behind me, and of course the change of the scale um, is actually transformative. Of course we have to go further, so, so change is happening, but you're quite right, we need to accelerate the pace of that change, and that's what, what initiatives like, that, like the government and the climate emergency, that can help drive. And Rebecca, maybe just a really obvious question, but what does being carbon neutral actually mean, and how is that achieved? So when we talk about carbon neutrality as the, the UK as a whole, we look at all the emissions produced by the UK and we say those should all go to zero. And it could be that actually we can't reduce everything down. So there's some sectors like aviation, which are really hard to make completely mm -hmm. sort of not emitting CO2 at all. And also agriculture sector, particularly an issue in Wales, it's going to be really hard to make that sort of zero carbon. So when we say neutral, we actually mean we might have to bury some carbon to make up for the fact we might be releasing some carbon from other sources. And then it balances out. Juliet, we've seen you know, we, we've got a very rich history of coal mining in Wales. You know, we, coal was king, was the, was the phrase that was used here. You know, how do we break with those traditions of the past? You've all talked about this need for some sort of, you know, revolution or certainly a change in mindset. Uh, and I think that's also one of the reasons why uh, governments need to be involved in this, because I think we do need to absolutely make sure that this is what people are terming a just transition. 
and that as old industries disappear, there are plans as to how can you retrain people and make sure that there are jobs available for them in the new industries. And for example, one of the things we're going to have to do uh, is we're going to have to insulate every home in the UK pretty much to a much higher standard than it is today because when we put in um, heat pumps and potentially um, some hydrogen heating for people uh, to replace uh, whatever they may have, you know, oil or uh, bottled gas or, or grid gas or whatever, um, we're going to have to make sure before we do that those houses are really well insulated so they use as little of these new fuels as possible. Now that's going to create jobs, local jobs, highly skilled jobs everywhere in the UK. And, and we actually need a planned transition away from uh, industries, away from the old industries to make sure people are prepared for the new industries. Otherwise, uh, people are understandably going to be very dissatisfied. Which then begs the question, Juliet, is this happening quickly enough? You know, we've talked about targets and timescales, yeah. but we've known about these threats for a long time now. So I think, I think before we kind of beat ourselves up too much, we do look at the need to look at the transition we have achieved. So when, when I set up the company I run, Good Energy, um, 20 years ago, we were at about 2% of renewables in the UK. Um, last year, 33% of the electricity yeah. was generated from renewables, and it looks like that's moved to closer to 40% today. So that is a massive transition over those 20 years. The, the point is the next part of the transition is going to be harder. Um, because you're going to have to actually change the systems. And as Julia said, you're going to have to start looking at how people use energy. Um, traditionally, what we've, what, what the, the way systems have always worked is they've just ignored the person on the other end of the meter didn't really exist in most of the engineering kind of design minds. Um, so we didn't really care about what happened in people's homes. Actually, that's going to have to shift. So we're going to have to care about what happens on the other side of the meter and encourage that to try and help us be more efficient about how we use energy over the whole system, not just on one side of it. And in terms of Wales' standing in terms in, with renewables, I remember doing an interview some years ago now where you know, um, the person said, well, Wales should be a world leader in renewables, and yet we're not. Why is that the case? Well, I'd argue in some ways we are. Um, I, I've been so impressed with my colleagues in, in Swansea, uh, Swansea University with their um, reactive building centre and, and specific, where they're, they're showing that you, if you use some of the new technologies, new solar PV, new solar thermal technologies, you can put up low-cost buildings, which e even... Uh, uh, Swansea, it's raining today, for, 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 um, uh, which is not so unusual in Swansea. Um, <laughs> but but, but they're, they're putting up buildings which are energy positive, which are solar powered and which didn't cost significantly more than a grid connected building. And, and, and that to me is exciting. It's also empowering because of course, if, 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 when you have people who have the power they use generated in their home and then they, and they integrate that with energy systems and battery storage and all this, then people can feel they have some control over, over their, 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 their energy needs and their energy supply. Oh, we're so entrenched though, aren't we Rebecca, in our traditional um, you know, tr energy production, you know, is the infrastructure there to allow this huge sea change? I think we've already seen a bit of a sea change with the offshore wind, so I think we've shown that we can do it. And, you know, 10 years ago, we thought offshore wind was, was so expensive it was never going to be competitive. Now it's the same price as, as other energy generation techniques. So I think we've shown we can do it, and I agree that we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much, but we also shouldn't underestimate the challenge ahead, yeah. particularly yeah. For, for the gas grid and how we're going to transform heating for people both on the gas grid and off the gas grid, like myself. I look at how can I heat my house in a renewable way. So there are definitely some challenges still there. And Julia, I wonder if you can give us an insight into the work of the Committee for Climate Change and really what the priorities are for, that you're discussing at the moment. Well, our priorities at the moment, every five years uh, we have to set a new carbon budget which we present to the Parliament in Westminster. It's a budget that covers the whole of the UK, but of course now Scotland and Wales also have their own climate change legislation and set their own carbon budgets. And in a way that's, that's quite good because that generates a little bit of competition and we generally find that Wales and Scotland are a bit more ambitious than, <laughs> uh, than Westminster is prepared to be. But at the moment what we're doing, we currently have in legislation um, five carbon budgets that take us out to 
2032, and that's to give you know, industry a good long-term view of um, how the emissions reductions need to be being delivered. Uh, so we're working now on the carbon budget that will take us out to 2037, the, the sixth carbon budget that will be. Uh, and we're very keen that we um, publish that carbon budget and uh, try to persuade Parliament to uh, put it into legislation uh, before the UK hosts the COP, the, uh, the big uh, global meeting on uh, carbon budgets uh, that will happen in uh, November next year. So we will be publishing our recommendation for the sixth carbon budget in, uh, in September. I have to ask you, is that happening fast enough then? Some of the years that you're talking, you know, it's quite a way down the line, and yet that we have a sense of urgency now, don't we? Uh, we? We do have need a sense of urgency because there are a lot of things we need to get in place uh, in order to meet our new net zero commitment for 2050. So a lot of things... Um, a lot of things need to be got ready. We need a plan for how we're going to uh, approach the insulation of all these homes. So, you know, what, what are, whatever our new government uh, is going to be after the election, what sort of policies are they going to bring in? You know, are they going to, are they going to for example, be looking at stamp duty and say, uh, perhaps stamp duty would be zero on homes that had already been insulated and have low carbon heating in them. So that would incentivize those people who are lucky enough to own their own homes uh, that this was a very sensible investment to make because it would make their house much more saleable. So the governments need to be looking at getting all these things ready. We need to be demonstrating um, whether, for example, heat pumps uh, combined with a hydrogen boiler will actually work effectively in people's homes and whether, whether people like them, whether people would find that a, a, a way of heating their homes they can interact comfortably with and they, and they feel safe with. We need, we need, so we need some demonstration problems. We've got a lot of change to deliver, but, but some of it we need to demonstrate that that's the right way to go and we need to get people on board with those changes. If we turn to some of the questions that the audience has submitted before this event, um, People wanted to know if Wales was making the most of its natural renewable resources. And by far the most asked question was about the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. And Juliet, I know you can tell us a bit more about this, because, but also you need to explain that you have a vested interest. Yeah, so, so um, we love Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon so much we invested. <laughs> so uh, we are an investor in Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon. Um, the, we have some of the biggest tides in the world in this country, particularly in this part of the country. Um, and Swansea Bay was meant to be a, um, a, a basically a technology breakthrough project, which would prove the capability of the technology itself. So they were using um, the, the barrage parts and the actual turbine, because um, the turbines go both ways. And they were also going to prove the economics and the fundability of these projects. So that was why they were going to start in Swansea with the project. Um, and it went through, essentially, it was part of different governments' political manifestos. So we've seen it positively embraced by the Liberal Democrats and the Conservatives and the Labour Party. Um, but actually, it's never come through. And, and I think that really has let Wales down because it's been a central government decision about a long-term contract to promote the, the project here. I did have a sense, you know, as a journalist, that there was a lot of public support for the project and people yeah. were genuinely disappointed and saw it as a missed opportunity when it was turned down. Is that it for the Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon now? I think, well, I mean, what, what is it in politics today? I mean, it's very different. We're about to go into an election. I think climate change will be debated as part of this election for the, probably the first time. Um, and I think we are beginning to see commitments by different parties about what they might do. Um, we've seen quite a lot of commitments on energy efficiency already starting to come through from um, Jeremy Corbyn. We've seen commitments on Swansea Bay Tidal Lagoon from the Labour Party as well. Um, we've seen the, the pulling back from fracking from um, Boris. So I think, I think we will continue to see some of this debate come through. And actually, I think it's great because I don't think we've had enough public debate about climate and energy technology in this country. And I think politicians have shied away from it before. And I think we need to have it. James, do you think we need to sort of be, be, be more positive about renewables? Because it's almost as if we, you know, we sort of see it as a, as a duty, as a target that has to be met. And if we look at things like green job creation, th there should be good news there, shouldn't there? 
I think, I think there is both globally and in Wales. So there's more money now being invested in solar and wind than in fossil fuels and nuclear globally. Um, if, if the money is going there, you, you could argue it's not going fast enough and we've got to change and, and we have to transition faster. But money is flowing. And, and Wales has expertise in renewables, huge expertise in renewables. Um, for, 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 I come from London a lot of the time, and what's striking here is the level of industry which you have in South Wales, which can manufacture. And so our ability, for example, to manufacture solar-powered buildings, our ability to imagine that we can um, manufacture new technologies at scale in South Wales means that you could imagine um, Wales being an exporter, not just of, of energy, but of energy technologies. Yeah. And, and we have a leadership in some of those technologies. Rebecca, does that suggest that we're not doing the best to exploit what we have here in Wales? You know, if we look at other things, you know, like people asked about hydroelectric and wind power, you know, are there, are there opportunities there too? Uh, definitely. I think hydro, we, I think, have exhausted most of the economic hydro at the moment. So unless there's a breakthrough innovation, I can't see there being a lot more hydro. We actually have a good track record in hydro. There's certainly a lot more opportunity for offshore wind and also onshore wind. But obviously onshore wind comes with quite a lot of political issues. And it's really important to, to build your wind farms onshore with your communities. So I see a real role for community energy there to really give people in the communities value from having these wind farms on their doorsteps. And, and don't forget solar in South Wales, because I know everybody feels that it. we actually built a solar park just north mm. of Swansea in a place called Brimwulloch, which, which is performing at pretty much the average of all the solar parks we operate in the UK. So solar is a real opportunity here in South Wales as well. Isn't it about accessibility though, Julia? You know, people might say they want to do more, but they don't know where to start. You know, we've talked about big scale projects and government policy, you know, policy but what about individuals? Uh, there's a lot we can do as individuals. Uh, we can all certainly, um, well, those of us who, who have um, lofts can go up into our lofts and actually look at the thickness of our insulation because there are still many, many houses in the UK that don't even have the kind of thickness of, of loft insulation that is now recommended. And we can think about, are we heating rooms that we're not actually using? There are now more and more clever devices that will uh, help you to uh, control the energy you use in your home. I'm sure that Juliet's company uh, is launching products of this sort um, that will help us to, abs to cut quite dramatically the, the energy we, we use in our homes and things. Um, actually, one of the things we could all do, and I'm sure uh, many people here have gardens, one that I'm very passionate about. One of the globally, one of the biggest stores of carbon globally is in peatlands, and yet we're still cutting peat to put it into garden compost. We need to be restoring our peatlands in the UK, and we absolutely shouldn't be using peat in gardening. So please, next time you go to the garden centre, <laughs> read the compost bags and buy peat free. That's a real contribution you can make tomorrow. It's about informed choices, isn't it? Um, James, one of the questions that was asked was, why can't we stop burning fossil fuels tomorrow? We've already got a, a, an idea how we can decarbonise electrical power. Um, and we're moving towards that. We're not moving fast enough, but, but we are moving towards that. The hard things are how we're going to decarbonise heating and transport. And, and that's technically more challenging. Uh, it, um, of course, we can move towards electric cars. Um, we can use towards heat pumps. I'm personally very excited about can we move towards sustainable fuels? So is, is it possible to use sunlight and wind to drive making hydrogen from water? Um, making hydrocarbon fuels from CO2, reducing nitrogen to ammonia. If, if we, if, if those are things which would be transformative in terms of our ability to decarbonise the complete energy sector. But those are technically and scientifically challenging. We can do it, but we can't do it yet at a cost which is viable. This, is what another, this leads on nicely to another question that was asked, that, that, that these are potentially sticking plaster measures, so the other example was given, uh, burning biomass for energy production, electric cars was another example. So Rebecca, is that preventing, the question is, is that preventing the larger shifts that are required to meet these targets that we're talking about? I think it's all supporting us along that journey. I think 
we're, we're trying to find our way as we go along. So just talking about biomass, obviously I, I work for the world's largest biomass generator. Um, if we weren't burning biomass, we would be burning coal now. So it's really helped us to get off coal and to stop those emissions. Is it the right thing longer term? What's the best use for that biomass? And I think we have to work that out as we, as we go along. I think there's been quite a change recently in terms of scientific understanding. So what we thought we might have done two years ago, we might feel differently about now because we've got global scientists on the intergovernmental panel on climate change saying, do you know we really need biomass because we need to grow trees, burn biomass, generate electricity and capture the carbon and put it under the ground because we aren't going to meet our commitments otherwise. And so I think that shows how we're still learning some of these routes as we go on. And I think we have to have really open minds about technologies and really have a really wide portfolio of options. And yet your company is, is building a, a gas power station just up the road here. It's Abergathy, is that right? It is, indeed. So, so yes. why the decision to do that then, if, you, if you're trying to go down the line of biomass? Well, we're more about renewables. So we, we've got a broad portfolio of renewables of which biomass is some. What, but we, we feel absolutely wind and solar are where the UK will be getting the majority of its power. We think probably about 85% of its power. But then there's this 15% of the time where the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining. And what do you do? Long term, we obviously can't be burning gas in the UK. But in the short term, whilst this transition is happening, we see a need for really fast gas plants. The thing about this gas plant we want to build in Abergathy, it's really supportive of, of wind and solar, because when the wind drops and the sun stops shining, we can switch it on really quickly, just for a brief period of time, and then we can switch it off again when the sun comes out. And it's that sort of backup power, as it's called, which we think the grid needs, certainly for the next 10 or 15 years. So it's small amounts of fossil that really support this broader decarbonisation. But isn't that the issue, James, with renewables, is that it is an intermittent supply, isn't it? That is, that is its weakness, in a sense. It's a challenge. Batteries part, uh, are part of that challenge because you can, you can store power for short terms of batteries. But, but uh, I personally think that there's other opportunities to store energy. The most obvious one is to, to make hydrogen. If you've got excess electricity, you make hydrogen. You can then use the hydrogen um, as a store to, 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 um, and either burn it or put it in a fuel cell to generate electricity back again um, when the sun goes down or the wind stops blowing. But of course, it's also about understanding the system. Uh, and as we move, for example, to more electric cars, then we're starting to significantly increase the amount of, of storage we have in the UK. And if we can get the system right, then we can, we can handle quite a lot of that intermittency. In, in which case, it's a bit ironic that there was a figures out just at the weekend showing that Wales had the fewest, the lowest number of electric charge points yes. per head of population for the whole of the UK. I'm afraid so, yes. Which is, that's it's not a great incentive then, is it? Because if you get stuck, anybody who's travelled north to south, in, as yeah. many you of us have. You go towards Fishguard, you can yeah. get a bit stuck. Yeah, so, so, yeah. I mean, and that, that's about policy. Part of it's driven by, could be driven, Welsh Government could drive that stronger. Um, and also just looking at opportunities for organisations to start installing in different areas. So I think we'll see it come, but you need, you need governments to kind of support the initial parts to get things moving. But it's those gaps, isn't it, Julia, that I mean, it's not a joined up approach, you know, and so if, if people want to go down the route of getting an electric car, something like that is clearly going to put them off, isn't it? Uh, it is. We know from the research that, uh, that people feel more comfortable if they know where that they can, you know, they see regularly electric charge points and things. But I, I also think we, you know, in some ways, electric cars are still expensive compared with uh, efficient petrol fueled uh, vehicles. And we need to recognise that, you know, the, the average um, income per head in Wales is, is lower than in many other parts of the country. So it would be a bit tough to, to be relying on people living in Wales to be the early adopters of some of these technologies. We know that electric cars will get cheaper. We know that in the long term, electric cars are cheaper to make and cheaper to run and cheaper to maintain yeah. than in internal combustion engine vehicles. So actually, they will be great for Wales, but they may not be the best thing for most people in Wales now. So I don't think we should worry if Wales adopts that a bit later than, you know, say, Greater London, which I think, you know, we should be seeing that transition occurring much faster in London. But, but, absolutely, but actually, you know, we also need to be trying, all of us, to, to change our behaviours so that we do more healthy things, like we walk more often, uh, and we do need to be encouraging 
all of our councils to be providing better public transport because that will help everybody. We were, though, the first part of the UK to introduce the plastic bag levy, yes. which, you know, no, was introduced brilliant. without any problem, really. Everybody embraced it, it almost immediately. But it's, it's, that's the thing. It's about making it easier for people to make mm. those changes, isn't it? And we have got the Future Generations of Wales Act, which I'm very proud of living in Wales and having this fantastic act, which does mean that all decisions have to be looked through with the sort of sustainable development lens. And if you look at the devolved powers for Wales, we, we have got control over our building standards, over how we design our cities and towns to allow for sort of people to walk and to cycle more. So I think there's an awful lot of opportunities for Wales to really be a leader if it, if it wants to. I want to come on to the issue of affordability a little bit later, but first of all, I think it's the time for a little bit of audience participation. So, um, a survey has been conducted by YouGov on behalf of the Royal Society, and the results are in. So, um, I'd like to ask the audience members here tonight a bit of a straw poll, if you don't mind. Um, so, I'm going to ask who you think is most responsible for taking action on climate change. So, I'll just tell you that the choices are government, industry, or individuals and the public, okay? So if I ask, first of all, who thinks that the government has responsibility? Okay. Um, and how about industry? And then finally, individuals. Okay. So clearly, the majority of people think that it's government uh, responsibility. That won't surprise you, Julia. Uh, no, I think the government has to put in place the framework that then enables all of us as individuals yeah. to act. So it's like, you know, somebody has to be responsible for making sure those charging points are there and we can all see them so that we can actually do the right thing and when we are thinking of having a new car, invest in a, an electric vehicle. But, but we can't just leave that to the market or it's going to take far too long for all of these things to happen. I so. Sorry, I think, I, we, I think we can see the results of the, of the poll. So this is the, uh, answering that question. So it found that, uh, as has been reflected here tonight, that government were most responsible, then the gen uh, industry next, then the general public. Interesting there to see that uh, quite th th more people thought that schools had a responsibility than scientists. So, <laughs> 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 but I think that's really important, though, educating and teaching. You know, we've seen um, Extinction Rebellion and what that's done to, for, to help our politicians make decisions around this. So I think educating the public and starting with school children is really important in terms of how we are going to get change. I mean, Dee, we've seen Italy today announcing that every child in every Italian school will have climate change lessons. Hmm. Do, out of interest, do any of you think it should be on the curriculum here? Completely. Yes, yes. yes. of course, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, but, 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 it's but, just laughable that it's not. No. But I, I'm very aware, because obviously I, 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 I teach a, a, a lecture um, undergraduates and, and, and postgraduates, and I'm always stunned and impressed by how motivated so many young people are about the challenge of climate change and what to do about it. Yeah. So many of them want to find ways to contribute, to, 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 do it, to help in to be part of a solution, not part of a problem. And that, to me, is wonderfully exciting. There's so many things which are scary about climate change, but for young people, it's not one of them. Yeah. I agree. We have seen, this, you know, obviously the school strikes, you know, Greta Thunberg, you know, has, has led the way. Um, and we've seen this sort of wave of, of action, which has now become a global movement. Yes. Yeah. Um, so if we move on, I think this is, this is going to be quite interesting, hopefully. So we want to talk about actively making changes to reduce carbon footprint. So um, we're just to use, I think we've, we have got another slide to show the results of this in terms of how people are changing their habits. So I just wonder, again, if you don't mind, a show of hands. So um, how many people here recycle more? Okay, so that's really good. That's really impressive. I mean, again, because it's, it's easy to do yeah. so, isn't it? You well, we've made it easy in Wales through leadership. Wales has the best recycling rates in Europe. I'm always really proud of this whenever we talk about what Wales is doing. And that's because the government has put infrastructure around to collect things from curbsides. And we don't have that in the rest of the UK. So that's, an, that's a, perhaps a combination of people's choices and also the government supporting that to enable it to happen. I think it's interesting to see what the second choice is here. So. Um, intentionally purchasing locally produced food. So again, would people here agree with that? How many of you are doing that? Okay, and then 
I think this is quite interesting. I'd like to find out um, how many of you have intentionally reduced your red meat consumption? Okay, that's, you know, in a country where red meat is, you know, the backbone of the Welsh uh, rural economy. That's really interesting, isn't it? Um, and we can see as well that's the choice of being vegetarian uh, and vegan. They're very low down driving an electric car, very low, but that, that might be back down to the... Uh, the lack of charge points <laughs> in various parts three of ones, Wales. I think. Um, I've got the, the figures showing um, also here. Um, so the decision, actively deciding not to have any children or fewer children, has anybody here made that decision? Okay, I mean, it's a bit late, uh, say for, for me, myself personally, it's a bit late. Uh, and I also, I also, as the mother of twins, I had one more child than I had intended to have, but you know. <laughs> I definitely think there's a trend though, we're seeing from the kind of mm. 18 to 24 year olds beginning to say, I, I'm not going to have children, partially because they're not sure what world they're going to bring them into, but partially because they're aware of the impact of population on the planet. But it's, that's an interesting, you know, that, that would be, that's a huge change. And it's something that's quite controversial, though. You know, governments yeah. or, you know, the United Nations has backed off talking about this, you know, as, but as I think act. it's going to come through naturally, anyhow, in developed countries. And what about here? Do you think we'll see that trend continuing? It's difficult in, to know, really, isn't it? In Wales? Well, in, yeah, in the UK in general. Oh, yeah. I guess this was a survey in the UK or mm. in Wales, and people are saying that. And I think, yeah, glo global birth rates have declined, not by much, but a certain amount. So but, but we also know that in, in developing countries, as people become more affluent, the birth rate drops. And I think rather than, you know, rather than us in a, a rich country looking at them and saying, gosh, they should have less children, yeah. we need to be supporting them to have the kind of lifestyles where they don't expect half of their children to die. Yeah. You know, so that, that, that means they will stop having as many children. They will want to be more like us. And we should be helping them do that, not criticizing them for having Great. too many children. Um, one other interesting question here, and it's quite high on the survey results, is reducing how often you choose to fly. Um, so what about, sorry, the, light, the lights have gone dark. Um, can I just have a rough idea of, if, if, have you actively decided to fly less? Yeah, that's quite, that's quite significant as well. Um, we're going to move on to maybe talk about public transport in a minute, but um, this, uh, any of you uh, yeah. flying less? Yes. yes. Has that been easy, an easy decision? Not always. If you need to go to Glasgow to go and speak on a panel at nine o'clock in the morning, it can be a little tricky, um, but you make it work. James? I try, of course. I, 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 um, your star is a good start to get, to get into Europe. That's very useful. I mean, sorry. I, I prefer the train anyway, so yes. it works very well for me. And I prefer to holiday in the UK. So I think it's about these choices. You do the ones that are actually perhaps easier for you and yes. fit with your preferences. Yeah. And so I've, I've perhaps started by doing the things which actually that's not too big a stretch for me to do that. And, and so I find, I have to say, the plane one quite easy because I really don't like aeroplanes. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, again, it's having those choices, though. So yes. if the alternatives aren't great in terms of public transport, and I think, again, anybody who has experience of trying to get around various parts of Wales will know yes. that it's not always easy. Yeah. You know, it's difficult then, isn't it, to make those choices? Yeah, it is. And, and the electrification, obviously, of the, of the railways, I think is something that needs to be reviewed. And yet, that was another decision that was made to not yes. electrify yeah. the line from Cardiff to Swansea. But, but it is another, um, you know, James was talking about the, you know, the really, you know, really positive combinations we could have of, for example, offshore wind and making hydrogen by electrolyzing water um, so that when the wind is blowing and at times when we don't need the electricity, we can use the spare electricity to produce hydrogen. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, we could be propelling trains with hydrogen. It's a perfectly safe thing to do. Um, there are demonstrations going on. And actually, all of those lines that it may not be economically viable uh, to do electrification on, we could still be making them, we could still be planning to make them zero carbon train lines, and we should be doing that. I was reading with interest about the electric mountain in, in North Wales, mm -hmm. so in Dinardwick, so, um, you know, th th designed to cope when there are surges of, of power, you know, that this was a sort of backup plan. You know, that, that, that's an interesting development, isn't it, Juliet? 
Um, well, so, I mean, I think what's really interesting is you obviously have to take quite a lot of land mass to do, to, to do what, 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 what was done in North Wales with that hydro power station. Um, I think what we're seeing now is new technologies come through that can provide the same service to the grid. So battery is something that can switch very fast on and very fast off. So you have hydrogen, which provides a different service to the needs of the energy grid. And then you've got things like battery, which can support with Devonic, um in terms of when you get outages or when you get significant shifts in other power stations. And that's, that's why an integrated grid is really interesting. One technology, if you just go for one technology, it doesn't work. You've got to look at integrating lots of different technologies together. I think, would you agree that the results of the, the survey are quite interesting, aren't they? In t especially in terms of the how, how it ranks, you know, and maybe there are a few surprises there in those results. But we'll leave that there for the moment and return to the questions that the audience have asked tonight. So if we look, start looking about maybe more what people as individuals can do. So if we look at the way that we heat our homes, yeah. um, let's, there have been a number of questions on this. So. Uh, the first one being, why aren't there minimum standards for renewable and efficient homes in towns and cities? James? I'm not a policymaker, but of, of course I, I'm aware that um, many of our political parties are now starting to talk about um, zero carbon um, buildings, uh, uh, passive buildings, uh, uh, energy positive buildings. And I think one of the exciting things is how we can develop new technologies to make that easier. Um, I, I'm well aware of that if you want a solar power building currently, then you put your silicon panels on the roof. Uh, and, and I'm excited by, by this sort of stuff. <laughs> so, so this is a, um, a, these are solar cells um, printed here in Swansea. Um, and and, and this, this sort of, of it's, a, it's, a, it's a semiconductor ink which is printed onto plastic. But it means that when you have something like this, you can imagine integrating solar cells into building, into building infrastructure. So How that, does that work then? It, 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 it's, a, it's an ink of semiconductor, it's the same idea as silicon, um, except that this is a, 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 a material you, which is which photoactive, you shine light on it, it makes electrons and holes, it makes a current, but it's an ink. Uh, so, so, so it's printable, and so it's flexible. <laughs> and, and, and this allows you to think about um, integrating solar cells into buildings in ways which are almost invisible, uh, I, I, and which could really open, open up the door to, to integrating. For, for, we, we already are seeing things like this out in the fields, but our, our cities are huge yeah. resources, which, which um, would, would be so fantastic to, to um, be power sources themselves. But it's interesting, I, you know, again, as a journalist, I've covered you know, stories where people in, in various communities in Wales have, have not wanted these solar parks or solar farms, you know, on their doorstep. And, you know, they're citing, well, the tourism industry is hugely important here yes, in Wales. Of course. It's an eyesore. No, of course. It, 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 it may be less of an eyesore than some wind farms, at least, at least on land. It, at, at least in terms but of, but of, I think of public perception. we have to be really perception. careful that we think, we're, we're thinking in an older mindset, because actually some people think they're beautiful. Mm. And actually the opportunity, interesting with solar, is that you can regenerate from a biodiversity point of view because the land goes back, you can re regenerate the soils underneath and mm. most often you can still use sheep farming, quite often you put, um, you put bees and you, you integrate that into the landscape. <laughs> so, and most of the time you can't see them because they're behind a hedge. So, so I, think, I think particularly on solar and then some people love wind farms. I mean, I come across, we, we own a couple of wind farms, people go there on holiday to go and look at the wind farms. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, I, so I do think we become need to a thing. Sort of st yeah. stop the sort of attitude that everybody hates them. Something like 75% of people in the UK would like to see more wind farms in the UK. So I think, I think sure. it is, it is sure. a smaller minority of people who don't. But if we look at, you know, why then, Rebecca, don't all new builds come with solar panels? It seems so obvious, doesn't it? <laughs> I think I would agree. I think we should be we should be changing our building regs to to do that. I mean, we do have quite strict building regulations, but they should certainly be a lot stricter, particularly with respect to insulation. Actually, which is Julia's point, we're locking ourselves into a future by building houses now, which aren't which don't even have the basic insulation that we need. If we want to move to things like hybrid heat pumps, which are this sort of electric heating that requires very insulated homes. So it's not only solar panels, which are a very obvious demonstration and a bit sort of sexy. We 
we actually need to get the other yeah. basic things right as well. Yeah. And again, I think that's where Wales has a real opportunity to take control and take a leadership. And, and it, was, it was a real shame in 2015, we reversed the zero carbons regs, which was all new houses were have to, going to have to be zero yeah. carbon. And we reversed that as, as a result of the general election in 2015. And I think the opportunity now is to go back and reinstate yeah. that. But in that case, we're going backwards. You know, we're talking about these targets you know, we we're, we're never going to get 2015, there. Yeah. So we need to go forwards now. Um, Julie, we talked. Sorry, I was going to say. Can I just say that that, that we we also need a, a system where not only are there building regulations, but they need to be enforced. Yes, because we know actually that most houses, new houses today, sadly do not even meet the standards to which they are uh, theoretically built. And and you know, we know about the Volkswagen car scandal. When, they were, when people were buying cars which they were told had particular fuel consumption and that those cars uh, had software inside them that was kidding the tests. Yeah. So you were being sold a lie. Uh, well, where is the scandal about Britain's houses? Where is the scandal that says, this is the standard your house was supposed to have been built to, but actually this is the real performance mm. of your house? Because we don't have those obvious tests for our house, Almost everybody who has bought a new house in the last 10 years or so has not got the performance that nominally that house should have had. So we need a huge improvement in the quality of our building. And actually, we need to be training uh, people to be really skilled builders and, and fitters and installers of, of new low carbon heating systems. These should be really high quality, high paid jobs, which, which are skills that you know, young people should be aspiring to have. And sadly, we don't have a building industry at the moment with that kind of aspiration. And that's what we need to deliver the quality of buildings we need for the future. In the absence of that, then, I mean, if we were talking earlier about affordability, so, you know, what some people might describe as a scandal is the fact that so many people in Wales are living in what's known as fuel poverty. So um, 155,000 homes, at the, I think, are the current figures. So that's the definition being that, you know, 10% of the household income, more than 10% of the household income is spent heating the home. You know, if you're living in, in, in that kind of situation, you know, renewables, you know, th this is all luxury, isn't it? It's very dear to my heart, this, because I spent years renting very damp cottages with no insulation <laughs> and electric storage heaters. So I was, you know, living in this sort of fuel, fuel poverty. Um, I, th I think we do have to start with social housing and yeah. really look at what we can do there and particularly groups of houses where it's going to always be simpler to, to do a sort of heating, heating system for that and then just making sure that, that new builds do meet the right regulations. Uh, is, uh, is there uh, funding available? Shouldn't there be funding, though, and incentives? Well, I wonder whether you might, might look at it a different way, because most people, so, so if you've got a rental income from a private rented house, maybe we should be looking at those should be taxed higher if those houses don't meet the energy efficiency standards. Mm -hmm. So your income gets taxed um, unless you put the energy efficiency in. So I think we need to think quite inevitably about the different, we've got loads of different tools that we use for everything. To so taxing the landlords, then? Yeah, in terms of why not? Forcing, yeah. No, because, because if they got a tax advantage for making sure those homes were warm and cosy for the people who want to live in them, then there would be health advantages, so you'd have a, a lower impact on the NHS, and you would get um, the, the energy efficiency and the carbon piece. So suddenly you, you move to a win-win situation. It's, I think it's worthwhile emphasising that Swansea is leading the UK in this area. It has this active building centre, which is the UK centre, for, for, for driving out a, a, a programme of low-cost, energy-positive buildings. And, and that includes social houses, it includes office blocks, it includes teaching facilities. Um, and, and what they're trying to do is show the building industry what's technically possible with today's technology. It, 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 it's possible to make um, warm, well-insulated, um, energy positive buildings without large cost in the UK now. We're talking about you know, new builds. What about providing incentives or funding for people who want to switch from where they are currently to maybe renewables? So I recently went on a tour of South Wales with Wales and West Utilities, and they're just doing some fantastic work there, retrofitting houses with hybrid heat pumps. So this is this way of transforming your heating over to electricity in a really efficient way. And I was so impressed by that. And I think that's a company that's really taken some leadership. Um, 
then I looked to try and do it at home, where I am, up, up in, in Llangarig, and um, couldn't find anybody, actually, who could help me do that. And it was also going to be very expensive. So I think there's, there's two issues. There's definitely the need for some financial incentive, some sort of grant system. Um, but also, I think, like Julia was saying, we, we need to get people into installing these and being trained to do it, and that will bring costs down as well. Yeah. Just I a quick question as well about, sorry, yeah. smart meters. You know, yeah. Is that the way forward? I mean, I well, 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 let, let me I'm being bombarded. More on that. One of the really depressing things that we've just done in the UK is we've taken the VAT on solar panels from 5% to 20%. We didn't need to do that. We haven't done it for ages. We're claiming it's an EU reg that we have to implement, but it's quite possible that we could find a way around it, I'm sure, in our current situation. So I think one of the other things is that we keep seeing, there's, there was an article, I think, yesterday in the Times talking about um, business rates on schools who wanted to put solar panels on them. And that completely undermines the economics of putting solar panels on schools. So we've just got to stop these stupid things getting in the way. Um, in terms of smart, smart's really interesting because smart meters were sold in as a technology, I'm afraid, by the industry in the wrong way. So, so we kind of went around it in the wrong way. We are getting there. The new second tier um, smart meters are coming through. There are much better technology. But what nobody has really explained is that they become a foundation for implementing a much better low carbon Britain. And what everybody said, oh, you'll save 10 pounds here or you'll save it. So obviously, no wonder nobody's really that interested. But actually, if you can completely transform the energy system in the UK by putting smart meters in and helping people become part of the solution in their own homes, then I think that's a much more positive message. And we just haven't been talking about that at all and the possibilities around that. The cheapest, the greenest option has to be the cheapest option. Is that oversimplifying things? Uh, unfortunately, it is. <laughs> I mean, we fortunately now, in terms of electricity generation, the, the greenest option is the cheapest option. The cheapest way to generate electricity in this country is onshore wind. And now the second cheapest option uh, and cheaper than gas or any, any of the fossil fuels is offshore wind. So the greenest option is the cheapest option. Uh, it will also be true as the prices of, of, um, of electric vehicles come down, that will be the cheapest option for motoring and it's predicted that should, we should get there by the middle to the, to the late 2020s. So we've got a bit of a wait to bring the prices down. But, um, but unfortunately, this issue of how we're going to heat our homes in a zero carbon world, uh, this is actually one of the more expensive problems that we have to solve. And I think that's another reason why we really do need government intervention uh, and government support to provide the framework for that. Um, all governments have all sorts of taxes and incentives um, implicit in our energy system. And one of the things they need to do is take a big step back and say, how do we make this transition to low carbon heating fair for everybody and we don't leave the fuel poor in a worse position than they are today. And that's the reason why the Committee on Climate Change uh, in our report on net zero said to the Treasury, you have to produce a report looking at where the costs of this transition fall uh, and you have to think about how you are going to make that fair and not um, make things like fuel poverty worse. Unfortunately, the accept Treasury have accepted that uh, and that report, uh, that study is now in progress. I'm going to move on to another question that was asked about the particular challenges of decarbonising Wales. There's a, there's a challenge. So um, if we look at, first of all, so we've already talked about red meat being the sort of backbone of the Welsh rural economy. And I have to say, I live in an area where, you know, dairy farming is very, is very prominent, as, uh, just about. But I, I wonder in terms of, you know, there's this sort of conflict, isn't there, between farming and the environment at the moment. Will we have any farmers in the future? I think we will. I yes. just think they might be farming slightly different things in a slightly different way. I think with our different relationship that we may have with Europe, we've got an opportunity to look at what we want to do with our land in Wales and how we might support farmers to do things which do support the climate. And it's not that we can't have any sheep because I'm very partial to a lamb chop myself. You know, I live in a, an area of sheep, sheep farming country. Um, I, th I think it's that, that we need to look carefully at 
where we're having sheep, where we might put trees. We also need to look at how innovation can really help agriculture as well. So, for example, Aberystwyth University have got some world-leading work on, on ruminants and on how we can manage greenhouse gas emissions from, from sheep and cows. And there's other things that farmers can do which just make really good economic sense as well about how you manage your fertilisers, putting them on the right time, not putting too much on. So I, th I think there are a lot of options for agriculture. I think it is challenging, but um, certainly don't think we should all be become vegetarian. I think it's about making slightly more conscious choices and also being really cognizant of the other things which farming adds to the environment, to biodiversity, um, as well as climate change. Because a lot of farmers would argue that they are guardi guardians of the landscape as well. It's not all about livestock production, is it? Can I, I mean, I think one of the perceptions we have in this country is that, is that, that farming is actually a kind of economically rational thing to do. And, and actually, in, for the most part, it isn't. Half of farm income in this country comes from um, the common agriculture, the cap payments. Now, as we come out of the EU, those, repay those payments are going to have to be replaced. And they've tended to be focused on the area of farms and the amount that farm, the food that farms produce. Uh, in replacing that, and we're going to be replacing them with something called the environmental land management payments, uh, we have the opportunity to pay farmers to do different things. I mean, the last thing we want to do is, obviously, is to happen is, is the removal of cap payments to, to destabilize farming and, and land prices across the UK. But we have the, we have the chance to incentivize farmers um, to be planting more trees to absorb carbon dioxide, to be replacing, uh, to be planting new woodlands, um, to be actually to be planting bioenergy crops, which will help us do generate um, power with bioenergy and then capture the CO2 uh, and store it, as, as Becca has been talking about. So I think this is a fantastic opportunity that we need to make sure um, whatever government we have after the election is really focusing on how do we help farmers to transition. But hasn't that happened already? You know, we've had various agri-environment schemes over the years that have done exactly that. You know, they've paid farmers to, to, to manage the land in a certain way to improve, you know, hedgerows, this kind of thing. That's been a tiny proportion of the cap payments. Now we have the chance to completely reform that system and, and transform uh, we need to transform the way we use land in the UK. This is our chance to start doing it. This is one of the urgent things we have to get our minds around in the next, in the next five to ten years. James? I, I actually come from Norfolk. Uh, and my, my uncle in Norfolk uh, was, uh, he inherited a, a traditional Norfolk farm and he's now transformed it, uh, transformed it. so the, the main money maker is the export of renewable power, ele renewable electricity from generating for, for, from, from um, methane, from the manure, from the cows. He makes more money from electricity from the for, 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 for manure than he does from the milk which the cows produce. Uh, and if, if you think about how to, the joined up thinking of, of how to, that you can change how you design a farm which has less environmental impact and, and can make money different ways. Fewer animals, in other words. No, it's the same amount of animals, but, but he, was, he was using the waste to make the electricity. Juliet, do you see you know, the way that we use the land? You know, we've talked about lots of changes, you know, some really quite yeah. radical changes. The, the way we use the land is, is one of those big changes we have to make. Yeah, I think we also, I mean, we haven't, uh, soil quality, is really important. I think the way we've been using land is is kind of has a limited life cycle, um, particularly when you over fertilize and you don't look at actually how you how you um, recycle carbon through through uh, nitrogen through the soil. So I think there is a real opportunity here, as Julia said, to rethink land usage. Um, and in some cases use it for energy generation, um, use it for different income streams, um, use it for biodiversity use, use it for carbon sequestration. So it, it is a massive opportunity and I think Wales obviously has a massive resource in its land and could lead on it. So rather than kind of worrying that somebody's going to take away, I think putting some great research into it, some great minds on actually what could we create because the tourist industry is incredibly important in Wales so thinking about that I mean one of the most beautiful places I've been to recently is a lavender farm in Wales 
which is it's producing local lavender oil. It's, um, it, it's, it hasn't got any, I don't think it's got any animals on it at all, but it's completely transformed. So they run, they press the oil on site and then they create hand creams and soaps and all those kind of things. So they've got an income stream, they've transformed the land and they've created massive biodiversity as well. So, you, so I think just thinking through some of the ideas of how we take this forward and being more creative about it. Let's look at also there at another industry, a heavy industry that's had a prominent role to play in Wales' history, which is of course steel. Mm -hmm. And if we look, you know, just down the road in Port Talbot, you know, <laughs> you can't fail to miss, you know, the enormous uh, Tata plant there. So um, I think it's quite interesting that, you know, we know air pollution is an issue there. And yet what many of us probably have driven along the M4, you know, the speed limit has been reduced to 50 for a bigger section now in order to reduce air pollution but I think people would ask well why not put you know change or put pressure on the steel industry to reduce its carbon footprint. It is starting to change. But, um, so a lot of the issue with the steel industry is that it uses um, coke to reduce the iron ore to, 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 through to steel. Um, in Germany they've now got a, a major demonstration program looking at using hydrogen to reduce, at least, at least partly, to reduce the iron or through to steel. And if you can make that hydrogen from, from renewables, from wind or from solar, then you end up with an, a steel industry which is far less polluting than it currently is. And I, and I know in Port Talbot they just started to look at exactly that. Because the fact is, you know, when Tata's fortunes have been sort of up and down, you know, recently, but it's still a major employer and people need, need to work, sure. don't they? But, I, but there's also a huge innovation budget now in the UK. I mean, the UK is looking to increase the amount of research and development so we can do this transformation to 3% of GDP. So why not actually take the opportunity to take some of these technologies that are sitting and have got issues and actually use research and innovation to really transform them into something of the future? And then that technology becomes something you can export worldwide. So, so, so if you look, um, one of the things we're trying to now do is print solar cells onto Port Talbot steel products. And, and so then the output of that plant is a renewable energy technology which we I can then export. I want a solar car. <laughs> I want, a, want those on this car, that would be yeah. so cool. <laughs> That's the idea, absolutely. Yeah. Again, though, we've come back to this point about how you can, you know, we're still, we've got one foot in the past, haven't we, with these kind of, you know, heavy industries, and yet we've, we can see this bright future. We've had some, we've heard about some, you know, real innovative um, projects t tonight, but... We're going to need these heavy industries, though. I mean, we can't build a wind turbine, whether it's a land-based one or, a, or a, mm -hmm. an offshore one, without steel. So we, we're going to need either hydrogen reduction to produce the steel, which is one route, or we're going to need um, to use carbon capture and storage on steel plants. And one of the things we need to be thinking about is, can we develop clusters of industries? So can we, you know, the cement industry here in Wales, the steel industry here in Wales, um, actually perhaps the gas power generation plant with carbon capture and storage. Absolutely. Could we bring all of those together uh, into a system where we were capturing the CO2 and if we get enough of a cluster of industries, it really starts to make it cost effective to put in the pipe work to, and the, and the uh, pressurisation to collect and pressurise that CO2 so that we can take it offshore and we can put it into old oil and gas uh, wells. And we are seeing that happen down, down in Port Talbot. There is a lot of work going on that. They're doing lots of R&D. They, they realise they have to change. But we have to make sure they can still remain economic and we don't just end up offshoring our steel. But there's something about being a leader in these innovative technologies. Absolutely. We have to remember the rest of the world has also signed up to Paris and we'll also have to solve these things. We're actually a little bit further ahead than other countries, particularly in this concept of capturing carbon that's released and burying it. And so the government of, are, are funding various studies on this and, and various sort of this cluster technique to try and get some e economic projects off the ground. In the next few years, this is one of those crucial technologies which we probably need to, to sort out in the next five to ten years in terms of whether it's feasible. So in which case, James, it's always going to have to be an integrated approach? Absolutely, it has to be. I, 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 I'm well aware that putting um, CO2 on the ground is one good strategy. I'm, I'm excited about um, can we use CO2 as a, a chemical feedstock? There are many chemicals, there's polymers and carbon fibres which need carbon. 
it's got to come from somewhere. And, and, and we're worried about CO2 emissions, say, from cement. That's, that's a, quite a hard one to get rid of. But we, if, can we turn into it with joined up thinking? Can we put a, a plant which is using the CO2 from a cement plant um, to make products which we can then use to build buildings? To, to me, that's exciting. It's not easy. It requires new science. It requires new catalysis. Um, one of the questions that was asked was, what's the number one change that we can make to make to most radically improve our impact on the environment? So it goes back to a little bit about the survey that we saw earlier, but I just wonder what your, you know, is there one thing? I mean, I we're, we're down to this sort of silver bullet idea, aren't yeah. we, that it doesn't no, exist? There's no silver bullet. I think you have to think in fives or tens in terms of the things that you should be trying to do. And I think coming back to Rebecca's point earlier, you should be trying to do things that suit you. So, so understand where your carbon footprint are. So do you drive a lot? Do you fly a lot? Do you eat a lot of red meat? Do you, so what, what are the things actually you mm. can cut back on that might have another benefit? So cutting back on red meat can have a health benefit. Um, not flying as much can make you feel better. Um, I mean, just, just because I think we have to look at the positive side of not doing things. Because unfortunately, stopping stuff is quite a negative um, psychological approach for humanity and so we have to think about what positive things do we want to do really sadly I do have an electric car and the thing I most enjoy about it is the software in it <laughs> more than anything else yes. <laughs> and and so and so so we have to kind of think about how do we get people to enjoy these new technologies how do we get people to embrace a new lifestyle that actually makes them feel better as Julia said walking more mm. I love walking I've just been on a walking holiday in Cumbria I feel so much better after a week walking in Cumbria than I have on anything else seeing sitting on a beach but it can be difficult Julia for people to know where to start you know to sort of feel well it's just it's just all too much and I don't know where to start. So over, I'm overwhelmed I just think I'll just stay as I am <laughs> well I, Greta Thunberg has this lovely expression which is um, what we need is more cathedral thinking. Um, and if you, I was brought up near Salisbury Cathedral, and uh, you know it took centuries to build. And the guys who started building it did it in with the faith that this would be a beautiful and memorable building. They had no idea how the roof was going to be completed. And we need we need that. We need we don't have to have the hundred percent picture. We have to start. James, what would you say are the positive steps that science is taking to tackle climate change? Scientists are, of course, a part of humanity, uh, and many scientists are young, and many scientists are very concerned about climate change. And many of the innovations, like, like this flexible foil here, or about um, the catalysis of making hydrogen, or how we've got batteries into cars, this has, come, this has all come about from science. Um, so, I would say that science, there are many scientists who are already very motivated to try to achieve, um, to, 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 to create the possibilities for the future. One of the challenges, of course, is to, is to translate that science into real technology and application. Um, and that's particularly a challenge, I think, for the UK. Did you bring any other props? No, no more props, <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I was wondering if there's anything else. No, no, nothing up my sleeves. Sorry. <laughs> Rebecca, what do you think um, you know, science's role is here? Um, I think science has been really good in getting the message out there. And I think then the general mm. public recently have been really good in amplifying that message. So we need hard data to be clear that this is actually happening, that the, the, the time for doubting is, is, is over. And scientists have provided that. Um, when I was appointed to the Committee on Climate Change three years ago, I had people saying, oh, climate change, what's that? Is that something I should be worried about? No one is going to say that to me now. I think we all know that. And that has been a combination of the scientists and, and, and the sort of public picking up on that. I do see a great role for innovation, and I don't think it's all doom and gloom. I see a role for, for the UK to become a leader in innovation and for us to, to really do very well economically as well through this transition. It's going to take some very brave decisions, but I do think that's... That's possible. Can I, yeah. can I stick up for the social scientists as well? <laughs> yeah. Because actually one of the things we desperately need is we desperately need a world where governments don't measure their success simply on the increase in GDP. If we all drive continuously <laughs> for, for more and more GDP, 
we're, going, we're not going to solve these problems. And, and, you know, in some countries, we have got to a level of affluence where um, do we really need to be thinking that, you know, we, every, every year we should no, be increasing GDP by 5%. There are some countries where they desperately need to be doing that, but we've got to find some other way of, of measuring success in rich, developed countries. We measure success in terms of how much we are reducing our carbon footprint. Yes. I mean, it, why not come up with a measure like that? I mean, what, what's really interesting is if we all reduced our energy usage by 30%, the whole, the whole, all households in the UK, we completely upset the GDP figures. Mm. So growth would go backwards because all the energy companies' use it, um, number, revenues would go down. Um, yet everybody in this country would be better off. Yes. So it's, it's really kind of like, so, yeah. so we do really need to think about where is that balance um, and how do we manage that? And I think we, we've got stuck in a cycle that we can just be extractive as a society and actually, we need to be regenerative now. And if we were talking about targets earlier, what is holding us back then? So the, the current target is to be carbon neutral by 2050. I mentioned that the Welsh government wants to see the public sector in Wales achieve that 20 years earlier. But what is holding us back then? One of the obvious challenges there, of course, is that 2050 is quite a long time in politics. <laughs> <laughs> and. It's quite easy for politicians to be aware, to have a, a, yeah. a target 2050 and do relatively little about it right now. I, I think leadership. I think government needs to give us the framework to get on and do the work. I think business is a real engine to be, to be able to deliver innovation, work with the science um, uh, scientists to come up with the science, then you need the innovation, then you need the public to embrace it. But you need the framework from the government to allow us to get on and do it. And at the moment, I'm afraid, we're not seeing that leadership. We've got a government that's going round and round in circles. We haven't got any thought leadership. And actually, I'm afraid at the moment, from the regulatory point of view, we're seeing it go backwards, not forwards. Doesn't that have to be then global change, you know, global pressure? Because, you know, leadership, you know, we're about to go into our, you know, third general election in five years. You know, leadership is inevitably going to change, you know, particularly at the moment we're seeing these, you know, changes in government. I think we are seeing global leadership, though. I think we're seeing a lot of other countries move a lot faster than the UK. I think we're lagging. We could end up lagging behind if we're not careful. In terms of the speed that things are going now, the deployment of renewables in other countries is increasing, whereas it has been decreasing for the last five years in the UK. So I think it's about getting, getting on with it now. Um, and expanding. Uh, we, we, I think what we're doing well is, is in science, actually. I think we're investing well in science. But we need, now need to lay out, for example, we've just done some work on something called Vehicle to Grid, which is a research project. And what that does is it says that um, you can plug your, your car in at home and then overnight it might supply energy to the grid when the grid needs some power. So it helps balance the whole system. It's a really interesting piece of research. We can't roll it out as an innovation because the legislation gets in the way. And that's my point, is that I think everybody, we've got everybody lining up to push out some of these technologies and these innovations, but the legislation isn't moving fast enough to actually allow us to get into market. We've talked a lot tonight about, um, you know, big projects, you know, so I mentioned earlier on about the biggest, one of the biggest offshore wind farms in the world off the North Wales coast, but what about a more community approach? You know, does it have to be all big projects? I think that's one of the points why, why it's so interesting to think about um, your own home as, as, as being a power station, because you, you, you then have a, some sense of personal empowerment. Uh, and I think one of the big and difficult transitions is that um, fossil fuel generation was big power stations, nuclear's big power stations, um, wind and solar can be microgeneration. Uh, and and that's, uh, it, that's empowering, but it's also it's challenging to the current structures we have of how we invest in energy in this country. Should we still be talking about nuclear? We've seen, you know, the project on Anglesey, uh, you know, being shelved. But, it, you know, should we still be looking at, you know, the problem being, you know, waste, really, isn't it? The, the, the volume of waste from modern nuclear power plants is very, very small compared to the historic waste that uh, we currently have in storage in the UK. So from our point of view on the Committee on Climate Change, we're, we're technology neutral. You know, if, uh, 
If nuclear is cheap enough, it will play a role in our models. The challenge with nuclear is that now that we've seen such dramatic reductions in the cost of, uh, of renewables, that nuclear just looks too expensive. Mm. Uh, and it's, it's at the moment difficult to see uh, whether and whether there will indeed be further major developments of nuclear power stations in the UK, because unless we start to see the cost come down very significantly, um, renewables are just going to win. And it's also quite slow. So, I mean, you can deploy significant amounts of renewables within three, four months. Whereas but cost is an issue there too. You know that was an issue with the, the Swansea tidal lagoon. I know. I mean, and Swan but Swansea is a first of a kind. But if you compared it to the first of a kind of on nuclear, then it would be cheap in comparison. So I think, but what you've got to look at in terms of something like solar. I mean, originally that was very expensive. Today it's really, really very reasonable cost, and you can roll it out. Mm in three, four months. So, so that's the point, is it's about speed now, as well as cost, that we've got to get on with. So we, we talked about nuclear, but why, I mean, I was asking you about, you know, your, your company's new gas station, power station. Why, why are we still, this is one of the questions that's been asked, why are we still building new fossil fuel burning power plants? Because of what we'd said about solar and wind and this sort of intermittency when the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. And ultimately, yes, we could have batteries and we, we could definitely see our car batteries acting as sort of backup. I think we're going to see, especially with digitalization and electronics coming in, a way of this sort of being able to, to store energy and, and, uh, use and sort of release it very quickly. And that's something that Dinor also does very well. But at the moment, sort of for the next 10 or 15 years, we're not in that position. I think it's really important when we're building fossil that we look at what we're building and why and how it helps that transition and what role it has to play and, and, and also how it could perhaps be converted to non-fossil in the future, which is certainly something for our plant that we're looking at to make sure it can be future-proof. If, if we've talked about reaching this goal of carbon neutrality by 2050, you know, how do, I just want to ask you all how you think we can get there. Because, you know, you, you've said about being positive, you know, and having solutions. So how do we get there, James? I'll just speak from a scientific perspective. I, I, I'm always inspired by plants. Um, if, 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 I, I, I started, started my life as a scientist studying plants and how a uh, photosynthesis works to harness sunlight. And, and for me, the, the challenge of what, I, what is often called artificial photosynthesis, um, can we harness sunlight to make fuel? Um, that, that to me is a holy grail, which we're, we're hoping to be able to achieve. And, 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 and I do believe if we can do that, that will have a major difference. How far off I, is that's, it? That's, that's only one thing. And I, I, I'm not saying that's a silver bullet. I know there's many other bullets really <laughs> as well. But, but to me, that excites me. I think we've, you know, we've established there isn't one golden solution, but um, it's interesting to, you know, to hear your thoughts. What do you think, Juliet? Um, I think... Uh, so, so I think everybody is going to need their own solution because everybody's lives are slightly different. I think we need to be flexible. I don't think we should be dogmatic about how we approach it. Um, but I think we should use every technology that we have um, I, think, I do think the marine technologies we haven't seen enough of in this country. We're an island state. Uh, we would see that we probably have a little bit of an advantage on that. Um, I think we need to see solar come back. I think we need onshore wind to come back. Um, and we need some leadership to make sure that those technologies come through. But at the other side of it, I really want to see the fact the, the when I joined the industry 20 years ago, everybody used to talk about meters. They didn't talk about customers, they talked about meters. And what everybody envisaged were these wires from these power stations to these meters, but they didn't think actually that there was anything on the other side of the meter. The person on the other side of the meter was kind of irrelevant in their world because they assumed that they would never respond. My view, vision is that everybody's house can become, become a power station. And my, my vision for the future with the digitization is actually you, you, you go to work in the morning, you close your house, and it starts trading. It starts looking after your energy for it. It tries to work out what is the most effective way of either generating power, using power, or making sure that your home has heat and light when you come back at the lowest cost. And that is what we should be aiming for in the future. How does a carbon neutral world look, Julie? Well, well in, our, uh, in our work at the Committee on Climate Change in recommending to the government that we should commit to net zero by 2050, all our scenarios are based on technologies that we have. So 
I'm very keen that James is funded to do his, uh, to do his, uh, his solar to hydrogen and all these other exciting things, but we're not, we don't need to rely on those to get to net zero by 2050. Those will be an added bonus. And of course, the world doesn't stop in 2050. We need all these new scientific developments to, to enable us uh, to get beyond there as well. So actually, a lot of it looks like things we already know about. But I hope it also um, that there is also some kind of lifestyle change in that, that there is this healthier eating. There, is, there are these new woodlands, these changes in land use, actually these, um, these new coastal areas where the sea level rise means that, uh, that we see kind of changes having to happen on the coast and perhaps some of the structures and buildings we have around parts of our coast will have to go. Uh, and actually that we make the best of those and we make this you know, a more beautiful island where we all get out more and enjoy these things more and a slightly less kind of consumerist in a way. <laughs> as, as an island nation, then, are we exploiting what we, what we can here? You know, couldn't we be doing a lot more? I think we have to do a lot more in many aspects. Um, I actually feel I'm, I'm an optimist. 2050, it's 30 years' time. <laughs> 30 years ago, I went to university. It seems like yesterday, and yet I was writing my essays by hand, and uh, I didn't know what a computer was. So when I look back, that gives me confidence that you know I've now got this phone with more computing power than a whole room. So that gives me confidence in innovation. But it also is quite scary because it seems like yesterday. So I, I have this real sort of dichotomy in my mind about how I feel about it. I'm just going to bring up one thing that we haven't really talked about much, and that's the investor community. So I work for a company which has shareholders, and I've really seen a real difference in, in the behaviour of our shareholders and in the banks and financial institutions that lend us money as a business to do renewable energy projects. And they are actively looking for projects now, and they are grilling us in the way that just wasn't the case a few years ago. It's cheaper to borrow money now if you can demonstrate that you are reducing carbon emissions. I think that's really, really positive. And a lot of that has come from individuals looking at their pension plans and saying, do you know, I'm not happy to be, to be funding this fossil fuel future. I want to do something different. So that's something where individuals are actually really changing large institutions. Mm. So that's one of the things that gives me quite a lot of positive and one of the questions that was asked actually is should we focus on reducing our carbon footprint or increasing renewable electricity production which we, we've discussed all those elements but it is, it's both is it, it, has it to be is both, both. Okay. Yes. yeah and, and I think we need to remember with with our carbon footprint our carbon footprint is not just the production emissions of what we do in the UK our commitments to Paris are about that are about our production emissions, our country emissions. But our carbon footprint uh, is the part of those emissions that we consume ourselves, so the bits we don't export, but also the emissions that we import in goods that we import, for example, from China. So we may hold China up and say, look, it's dreadful, all of these emissions, but actually we're responsible for a big chunk of those. Yeah. So when you add our, consumption, our imports, our consumption emissions um, up, which is those we produce here and use and the stuff we import, actually our emissions per head are almost double those that we normally account for when we're looking at getting to net zero. So we do have to move to a world where we start being more responsible for our overall consumption emissions, i.e. our carbon footprint, and not just our production emissions. Um, Juliet mentioned earlier on that we shouldn't be beating ourselves up. Do you agree with that, James? And that's, you know, that's part of the, you know, the, the issue, that people sort of feel overwhelmed by it all. In general, beating ourselves up doesn't do most people much good. <laughs> I, I, I believe we have to be positive. I, I, of course it's hard because you see the change in the world around us and it's scary. But I, I, I think I, I'm also an optimist. I, 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 I'm, I'm partly an optimist because I work with young people. And young people are optimistic. Uh, they're also scared, but they, but, they, but they want to try and drive change. And, and I, I, I do believe that we have to have some optimism that we can, we can change. The world is going to change. Climate change is happening, and we can't stop it. But we can mitigate it, and we can make it not as bad as it could be. And we, and we have to work towards doing that. And, and beating ourselves up just, just doesn't help us move forward. I, I, I think it's quite interesting. I think you need a bit of a yin and a yang. So I think you need to keep, yeah. 
get the pressure on. This, this is a very serious issue yes. and we have to take it very seriously. But at the same time, we have to be optimistic that we can do something about it. Mm -hmm. And you need to keep those two in balance and moving forward all the time. I, I'm happy to, to hear you all say that you're optimistic because, you know, it is, you know, positivity is something that we've d discussed. No, I'm know, scared. But, but yeah, I was going to say the well. scale of the challenge, <laughs> yes. you know, is not to be underestimated either, is it, no. Rebecca? So I've worked in climate change for my whole career. And I would just say the last few years, first of all, I think we really, really realising the impact of climate change, but we just suddenly see it going up the political agenda and the public agenda. So the last few years have been quite transformative, and that's what makes me feel quite optimistic at the moment. It's not just us sitting in rooms, you know, banging away on our own. Suddenly, I feel the, 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 you know, the population's behind us. We're really going to do something. So I think the last few years have really made me feel a lot more positive about change and about being listened to. Yeah. I don't want to take away from the seriousness of that challenge ahead, but I do want to just end on um, a survey that I think Juliet noticed earlier about the carbon, reducing our carbon footprint at Christmas, which um, is something that we could all make a start on. Yes, and I think <laughs> what was quite interesting about it is I think it said that um, the slightly older population weren't that worried about it. Um, and maybe 7% of the older population were doing something about it, but something like 60% of people between 18 and 24 are thinking about the carbon implementation, their carbon footprint of Christmas. And coming back to your point, Julia, that, that whole idea of what are we doing in other countries um, by buying all these mm. things. Um, yeah. I, I think there's a real opportunity also to try and think about every time you buy something, whether it's a shoe, your carbon footprint or or anything mm. think about where it's manufactured and maybe we should all just be writing to the manufacturers to say are you making sure that you've got low carbon energy helping your manufacturers i think one of the biggest areas of development at the moment is vietnam and they have a choice right now of building 37 new coal power stations or going solar and i think everybody here if you're buying any goods that are going to be made in vietnam we should be writing to people and making sure that they build it solar and they don't build it coal Julia, will you be reducing your carbon footprint at Christmas? Yes, we've, um, we, we, we don't have any children, so we haven't got that pressure. But I, I'm lucky enough to have a, um, a sort of a goddaughter who is um, an extraordinarily frugal young lady, and she's been a great conscious, because if you buy things for her, she sort of tut-tuts a bit, and, sort of, <laughs> and she's a great one for, for second hand, um, and she's a great one for things that are homemade. So we're moving towards uh, actually trying to find the time to uh, start to make things for, uh, for our, uh, our, our important relations and friends oh. at Christmas. But I'm not saying it's all magnificently crafty. We will be buying some things. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, we kind of, if you actually make that time, it does show, um, I think it does show an awful lot of commitment to people that you've done more than just look through a catalogue and, and zap off an order. And maybe it's a useful example of just those small acts that yes. can make a big difference. Do you agree, Rebecca? Yeah, I mean, I'm a very keen vegetable grower, so we'll be having my homegrown vegetables at, at Christmas. Oh, and we, yeah. we eat mainly our homegrown veg anyway, but I do that because I love to do it. And the carbon benefit is also is, is a bonus. And, that, and that she makes you. great jam. Oh, well, so do you. <laughs> <laughs> James, do you make great jam? I don't make great jam, no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but it's a, it's a place to start, isn't it? Of course. I, 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 one of the most obvious <laughs> uh, areas of reducing the carbon footprint of food is, is, is lower beef consumption. Because it, 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 um, in terms of, of uh, the carbon content, beef is so much higher than anything else. So certainly we won't be having any beef this Christmas. Well, as it happens, I, and I believe that is the topic for the next You and the Planet dis discussion that takes place uh, next year. But um, we're going to have to leave it there because uh, we've run out of time and it's been a fascinating discussion. So thank you to all of you who've watched online. Uh, and as I said, the conversation continues with the hashtag you and the planet. But I'd like to um, thank all uh, the panellists here tonight. So uh, Baroness Julia Brown, Juliet Davenport, Professor James Durrant and Dr. Rebecca Heaton. Thank you all very much. <laughs>